In this episode of the Ascent Podcast, we're going to dive deep into the feminine experience in this country. And I have a very, very special guest with me today who is a entrepreneur, a motivational speaker, as well as an educator. She's living her life in her own truth. She's got, she's had a hell of a journey and she's got a hell of a story to share. And she really just wants to talk about what it is that she has experienced from her perspective as she's navigated her way through life. And uh, here we are to talk about that. And as we put it, it's women. And that's what we want to get into talking about today. Uh, so welcome, women. Monique. So why did you want to have this conversation? What is behind you really feeling like you wanted to address this topic? I love that question. It What really came about for this moment was just this journey at this juncture in terms of my life, time, where we are as women, where we are in politics, and then all of the young ladies that actually call me and ask me or messenger me or if I'm just walking around and they just look for advice. And, and it just seemed to be such a void for real good advice. And unless you've had life experiences, you really can't speak to certain things. I try not to. And so since so many women were pulling at me, younger women um, asking me questions, since sometimes I give out such a young vibe and I like to really motivate women to be better. So it just came about from my own life experiences and really a crucial moment that just kind of happened that I'm coming out of. And I wanted to just speak to that because it was between two women. And my heart aches that women are not there so many times to support each other. I think we've been programmed that we don't do that. And I don't want for any woman to feel, young woman, old woman, any woman, to feel that there's not a support system for him, for her. And so that's how this really came about. And it's just been leaning really heavily on my heart to just talk about it so we can be about it. Okay, excellent. No, thanks for sharing that. And that's, it's, it's interesting you hear, hear you know, um, that said, because obviously from my side of the fence, being on the, the male side, that's something that we hear a lot of for, for men, you know, is, you know, not really being there to support in the in the in the, the true sense of the word, not just a drinking buddy to hang out with, but when times are really tough, you know, who can you really count on? Who can you really lean on? Um, when from man to man, and I know there's a lot that's talked yeah. about there about you know you know men do have feelings and how we should be able to share and support each other these types of things, but I bring that up because most times you hear or it seems as though the women and the cliques that they share are are more you know, sharing and giving and caring. But it sounds like from what you're describing, there's still kind of, um, I don't know, a delta or a gap, or maybe uh, maybe it's just misunderstood as to what that relationship really looks like within those women's circles. What can you share about that? What, from my experiences, since I tend to lean more, uh, mine is a little different. I tend to lean more more on the male psyche of things in terms of friendships. I know a lot of people believe that men and women can't be friends, but more of my closest friends are men. And what I find fascinating to me about women when they're discussing men and relationships and how things should be or shouldn't be, we're coming out of some old values and norms that every woman doesn't get to experience. And I think it seems to put this competition of what we're looking for um, versus a camaraderie of support on what we're looking for, what we need. And a lot of that comes from just our own cultural upbringing, our backgrounds, our hurts, our pains, our self-discovery, if we're even trying to do that. And so I'm in agreement with you. I, I tend to lean that I get more of the emotional support from the male side of life than I've actually gotten from the female side of life where I've gotten more wisdom and guidance uh, and understanding because what I'm coming to understand is men are looking at us from the outside in and they're hearing things when we're usually maybe talking or cackling or being judgmental or, or pointing or looking for whatever that other woman has. I've come to understand that it's been more men who've given me more support in those really tough, dark moments. And I find it fascinating that a lot of women don't know that men give that support. Um, and that I would love to see that from more women 
in my life specifically um, and that support system and how do you change that to have that inflection of women around you to engulf you, to give you that level of wisdom? Because I would rather hear that from a woman than to hear it from the male perspective. I've gotten that for years, amazingly. Um, and I, I, I didn't know that was a thing. So it's, it's just very fascinating to me that when I hear women talking, if I'm in those cliques or groups, I tend to pull away from them because the words and the and the subjects they're talking about and the experience, I haven't had those experiences. And so I was just like, there's a void there of a gap between what my experiences are and what I sen- tend to hear a lot of women say they've experienced in, in life cycles and life issues. Interesting. So let me ask this question. Do you feel that that's part, because you mentioned earlier about historically, you know, where the evolution of women and, and, you know, women's rights and these different things that have come along over the decades. So do you feel that there's a lineage thing that's kind of a line that's drawn through how they're tied together and how they relate to each other? Or is, is that where it's coming from? Or what are your thoughts on that? That's a, that's a technical question. It's a little difficult. But what I will say personally for me, if I go back just through my lineage, we're a very matriarch family. We come from a very um, wealth, a very strong, independent women um, that taught us to think the way you want to think, be who you are. And they each were their own personalities. I had the pleasure of meeting my great grandmother, my grandmother, and, and most of my aunties who live well into their hundreds and 90s. I mean, we're just now of them leaving this earth and each one of them planted their own personal seeds of wisdom. I've watched them go through their cycle of relationships, hardships, kinships, craziness. Um, And there's just that same pattern that we can kind of adopt on the good side. But then there's another pattern that we can adopt. Like in our family, most of us at after 40 or 50, we're not married. Now, to me, that's not a game changer. That's not a, a temperature gauge because there are some of us in today's time who believe in marriage. And there's some of in that institution. And then there's some of us like myself, not necessarily. I don't think that's something that I have to have. And I think when we're looking at women today or young women or any women that if they don't want particular things that we're judging them on that. And we're condemning them on those thought processes. But what if that's not, what if I wasn't the little girl that grew up believing in Prince Charming, galloping up on a horse to gallop me away? What if I wanted to get the horse myself and gallop away? (laughs) You know, does that make me a bad person? Does that make me not in tune to who I want to be as a woman? I don't think so. Um, So because I was brought up by so many women who were who did teach me specifically, I'm saying this very personally, um, that to have your own mind and to have your own opinion, um, that doesn't mean that you didn't, that I didn't have any de- wanting that other level relationship with the other. Um, but I also want to have my own hopes and dreams. And sometimes those can get derailed um, and in for many facets of reasons. But what I love about my lineage is that we call them the Skinner women because my last name is Skinner. So I met most of the Skinner women and they're their own, they were their own entity. You know, each one had its own personality. No one was the same. And that's what I love about that. Cause we're not the same. You know, no one woman is the same. I'm not trying to be you and I don't want you to be me. I want you to be you loving you. And so that's how I look at it. And that's how I've been, brought up. And I love that. And I think I've gained a more respect for it as I have matured um, into these 50 plus years. And, and I love it. I think it has made me to have a self-reflection of they did a good job of teaching us our independence, not lack of family and not lack of owning who we are and wanting to have some sense of, of foundation, not so independent that you know nobody can be around you. But just that moment of you look in the mirror and say, what do you want? You know, no one should be, no other person should have that control over you and your mind to be able to tell you what you cannot do. Those women did it. They didn't let nobody stop them. They didn't let nobody hold them down. If they wanted to do it, it didn't even matter their age. You know, my great grandmother at the age of 95 got on the plane for the very first time. 
because she just wanted to leave Houston. She was like, I'm done and left. <laughs> Didn't come back. <laughs> and so I've always admired that, you know, if they wanted to, I have an aunt just recently had faced her fear and wanted to go to Italy. She had been talking about it for a thousand years. She woke up and did it. She's 80. Come on. So I love the challenge that it has brought to just me as a woman being independent. And, I, and I've and i said this even to my own daughter. Go do you, boo. Don't let nobody stop you. And I think we can get to where we let fears and societal norms or other people's opinion, other people's opinions, other people's opinions stop us from what that inner voice is telling us to do. And I think fear just locks us down. And so as I face my own life cycles of fear challenges, which I'm still doing today as, as we speak, it's a challenge because it's scary. You don't know, you don't know on the other side of the unknown, but I'm challenging myself to face those unknowns because they're coming anyway. I mean, no one day is known. Um, even if you go to work to the same place every day, you don't know what's going to happen. So why not take an opportunity as women? We're in a we're now in an influx, as you as we can tell every day in social media, any media, that it's a challenge now to understand what does it mean to be that woman of today. Um, and I think that's something that we all have to do an introspection about. Agreed. So you mentioned in, uh, earlier in what you were just saying there about um, family or maybe not being married at a certain age, a certain stage. Uh, and as you closed out at the end of that, you were talking about, you know, trying what is it, what does it mean to be a woman in this day and time and in this age? And obviously what I wanted to kind of get into a little bit is about um, being a mother, you know, bearing children, you know, and that I think uh, obviously at one point in time was kind of the definition of you know, mm -hmm. this, this is the woman's role, that kind of thing. Yeah. And obviously that has evolved. Um, do you see that as being a, the, the what kind of where the line is of, you know, if, if I bring in a family and I, I have children and therefore I am woman, or is it more than that in this day and time? I think that's a personal choice um, at this point. Before you were limited, you know, there were many times you were limited if you wanted to have a child or not have a child. Um, some of us are teenage mothers. I was one. Um, and so there's just, I think the gift of today, I'm gonna do it in a positive way. I think the gift of today, you have that choice if you want to be a mother. What I don't tend to like is that if you don't want to be one, you're judged. And the key word to me in this whole message today is judging. What I want to do with my life is mine. What you want to do with yours is yours. So if you choose to want to be a stay-at-home mom, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a job. Dealing with children is a job. To make sure that they are sane citizens <laughs> and make sure that you are sane enough to raise them is honorable. So I love it when I hear a woman, just recently, this is literally just this week, when there were two teachers. Now here I am with my little one daughter and my bonus daughter that I call her. And I'm listening to two teachers who are in the room with me saying they have eight children. And I'm like, how are you standing? <laughs> what that is, I mean, I just wanted to bow. You're managing eight children at home and you're now here in this school with all these other children. Don't you want to run? <laughs> and they're like, but they love children. I love children too. That didn't mean I want to have a hundred of them. It just meant I love to love them and leave. Uh, you know, I love to give them what they get and I'm out. But they are in the trenches every day. Eight children. I mean, that never goes away. That just, that just never goes away. And so I, I have a respect, which is what I'm hoping that other women can start to see. If you want a career and you want that career and you chose to delay having children or not have kids, okay. That's, that's what you chose. So I'm just hoping that whatever the support system you, knew, you you have, that you have a support system to anchor you in that choice, whatever that choice is, whether it's to be a mother of today, a mother and a career woman, or, or whatever that is, just that you make that choice yourself. I, I'm, I'm hoping that whoever that individual is, 
that they make, they're able to make that choices. I think a lot of times we take on other people's opinions, whether it's your mother, your grandmother, a friend, an associate, that they can kind of influence you. And there's nothing wrong with influencers, but that still quiet voice when you are a little girl is still that still quiet voice that tells you in the middle of the night when you're dreaming and sleeping and wondering if you get the privilege to do that, what you want to be. And I think today's time, we're at an influx that we can be whatever we want to be. We have always have been able to be whatever we want to be. I think we just have uh, limitations that tells us in our head that we can't do it. And, and then there's some other obstacles sometimes that we just can't, financial, emotional support, you know, some things are just not in our control when we're in our youth. But when we become where we may be in a little bit more control and we can make those decisions, I, I think we have the gift of today to be able to just go for it. Just go for it. I, I believe in going for what you want and going for broke. Makes perfect sense to me. You brought up something I really wanted to dive into because obviously from the male perspective and then you're going to give the, the female perspective of this, but you said judgment. And that is something that I observe in watching women communicate and talk to and will interact with other women. Why do you mm -hmm. feel or think that that's such a prevalent thing? And what, what's, what's that rooted in? Where Where is that coming from that there is so much judgment and, and sometimes even malice between one side or the other within some of those female circles? I'm going to just attribute that to insecurity, low self-esteem. Um, you see something in someone else that you want that you can't have. Um, there's an interprospection of yourself because either you set a standard or a guideline or didn't set a standard and didn't see it. And, and you're looking for that avenue. Um, and then sometimes you just lose, you know, you just, you see, she might be having something you want, something as simple. It can be anything, a house, a car, a man, a child. Um, and then you feel like you have a sense of loss and that, that void, you, you're trying to fill that void. And when you look next door or across the street or right, sometimes your own relative, you see that they have it and you're trying to figure out, well, how did they get it? And I don't have it. I deal with that myself too. You know, what, what does she have that I don't have? How does she get that? And I didn't get that. Um, but there's just a moment that you have to take accountability on what are the steps to get it? And what are the steps sometimes to keep it? Because many of us sometimes get it and can't keep it because we don't appreciate what has been given to us. And so when you do do that and you do get it and you do face that fear and it, because you're facing a fear anytime you go after anything. I don't care what it is. I, I don't care what it is. You are facing a challenge to go after anything, anything. So if you have enough courage to face that fear or to face that goal of achieving something or uh, obtaining something, whatever it is, you that, that should just be self-rewarding right there. And then that should be giving you a moment to, just praise another human being, another woman, I don't care who it is, that they had enough self-respect, enough courage to just go after it. Um, and then when we, when you get to the point to where you're judging them or you're critical or you get to just complete malice uh, through enviness, that's on you because you're deflecting and reflecting who you really are in the mirror. Because in the middle of the night, you have to look in that mirror and be secure and have a soul for yourself. And if you can't go to sleep, I don't even know how some women can even go to sleep at night knowing that they've hurt another woman, that you woke up and either planned, plotted. And sometimes I don't think you, maybe sometimes you know, maybe sometimes you don't know. Because we're all on this journey of self-reflection, self-healing, hopefully. Some of us, not all of us. Um, but typically, hopefully maturity gets you there. And if you can do that, then I think you could take that that outward and if you can take it inward and start to get that inner balance of healing and perspective, perspective. That's my new word this week, perspective. Um, I think it, it would soften the blow on how we come at each other um, and love on each other or try not to hurt each other. Agreed. I agree with that. So I want to. Uh kind of uh, tag on to where you were talking about a little bit there because you you know you were sharing about um sometimes women 
get things and then they can't keep it, or maybe they're just getting it out of jealousy or envy or, or, or these other things. Um, and obviously a lot of the work that I do from a coaching and guiding people standpoint is to help them figure out what it's actually relevant, what's relevant for them or to them. Not so much what mm -hmm. Sally has or John has or, or whoever else. What is it that you really want? Because the thing that I see happen most often is men or women is you will go after a thing because they have it or you see it somewhere else. You attain it and then you're not satisfied or fulfilled because it's not really what you want in the first place, right? So you have just this kind of sense of not being fulfilled or satisfied, even though you put in the work and you've attained it and you're like, well, that was mm -hmm. unfruitful because, you know, it, it doesn't really resonate or mean anything to you. So I think that's mm -hmm. an important piece is to take some time, as you said, uh, to be self-reflective. And, you know, we talk about self-care and these other things, but really figuring out as an individual what is truly mm -hmm. relevant to you, what matters to you most, and, and put your energies and your efforts in those directions. And it's, it's almost like putting on blinders, right? So you are not distracted by what other people are doing or saying or how they may be moving, and you move kind of to the beat of your own drum. I know that's one of the things that we have talked about as far as you mentioned Skinner Women and how that was kind of their mission and they were kind of going on their own their own journeys and, and following to be their own drums. I think that's a very important thing to have and understand and, and get some clarity for yourself. That that's mm -hmm. who you want to be, what you want to attain and, and get past those fears to get out there and go get it. I think that's a very important piece. You talked about your friendship circles, right? And that, not to say that you mm -hmm. do not have women friends, but a, a mm -hmm. lot of the larger share of your friends tend to be men for for different reasons. So I'm going to assume that you probably get into some conversations or overhear conversations with these men about their perspectives or their feeling or how they feel about women, right? So what are you hearing out there on the street? What What's the general <laughs> perception? The man's voice. I don't think you really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> A loaded question. I would say this nicely. <laughs> they think you're crazy. They I mean, I just think women are crazy right now. Uh, the, and and, it, and I'm gonna I'm piggyback to your your seg I'm gonna segue back. And the number one thing is because they don't know what they want. Women at this moment do not know what they want. They're getting so much information, so many different avenues coming at you that they haven't taken the time to just sit still, just sit still and listen to you really want. Do you really want that house? Do you? Do you really need that house? Do you really want that car? And we're talking about material. And, and again, these things leave you. You know, material items come and go. I've had them. I've not had them. What do you really, truly want when the clears is quiet? Nobody's talking to you. But you can only do that from introspective. So to, to completely answer the question, when I hear men, they, they think we're crazy. They, and, and they're confused. They're, they're totally confused because they're, they have been listening. What, here's the fascinating thing to me. What I find fascinating for my gift of having a lot of male friends is they, women don't know, men really do talk <laughs> a lot to, I mean, literally, I mean, I get calls all the time just to vent and they're, they vent, vent, vent. But the number one thing I tell women that I don't do is that when a man tells me his interpersonal secrets, I don't use it against him. I'm not trying to set him up to get information so I can flip the script and say, aha, I knew you were like, I knew that was you. Because you're going by sometimes the experiences of other women who have been hurt. Now, and let me be clear, there are many women who get hurt and they're valid, hurt, but there are a lot of women who put themselves in to, to continuously to get hurt. You know, they can be, you can become a perpetual victim of your own choices. You can't. 
you can become that. Just keep doing it for whatever the reasons are. But for the most to answer your question, the number one thing men are saying is just that women are crazy and they don't know what they want. And even if you do get love, you know, whatever that means to you, some it's material, some it's, I would personally have a relationship to be able to sit, talk, I'm crying, you're there. That's more valuable to me. It always has been. I've never been a materialistic person. Um, and so it's valuable for me if I'm losing my nuts here and I go off and I pick up the phone, you're answering it. And if I'm saying I'm lost somewhere, that you are coming to get me. That to me is more valuable than a diamond ring or a house. So, and I have the gift of that, that the men I've ever even dated or been married to, they show up. You'd be there if I'm sick in a hospital because that diamond ring can't wipe my butt. That diamond ring can't comb my hair. That diamond ring can't take me out to lunch or to dinner. It can't do that. But you physically being there can do that for me. And so I think there's a, we have substituted things for a personal relationship. Um, and so I'd rather have a personal relationship than to have things that that's me. Now I would, prefer, I, you know, if I get the, the crown and get it all wonderful, but let, we have to live in reality because we, I think we put too much pressure on men and I think we just put too much pressure on men to provide us all of our emotional needs, our spiritual needs, our sexual needs. We put too much pressure on them. They're, they're a human just like you are. And I think we societal has put them in this box that they still be like this, look like this, act like this, talk like this, that like, I mean, like a robot. Um, when they hurt, they have inner, they lose people. They, they go through death of family members, jobs, careers, cars, simple stuff. Um, tragedy happens in all of our lives. And so I think we, as women, we can be a little bit more supportive of those men and, and knowing what we want and what we need um, when, when we are down um, and when we can actually express that. I'm hearing a lot of men women are very angry. And, and I get it. I get it. I've been there. Um, but that's something, again, that you need to do your inner perspective of healing because all that baggage and all of that. And, and again, you can't come out. Nobody's going to come in. Nobody comes into a relationship completely whole. I mean, always be whether you've done an inner perspective or not, there's going to be some remnant of hurt, pain, suffering, memories of bad situations. Um, but if if you can have, to me, a counterpart that can just kind of ease that on both sides to me. I mean, it goes both ways. I think we put a lot of pressure that it just souls to just only come the man. But what is your role in that? What is your role as a woman to give that support system as well? Um, and, and so, yes, uh, the answer that question, crazy. They think we're crazy. They think we just have completely lost our minds and don't know what we want. And I hear that too on my side of the fence uh, from the male perspective, but, I, and I can, put a little bit more meat on the bones from what I hear. And really, and it's, it, you actually hit right on it. And that's when we were talking about the physical versus the emotional pieces. And I think that's where men are the most confused right now, especially in this day and age, because a woman obviously needs the man to be there and support them, whatever the physical things may be, hopefully to be there and support them, the emotional and even spiritual things that may be going on within that particular relationship. But then the flip side of that is the woman looks at the man as if he be a man, you know, chest, chest out, chin up, don't show your emotions. That's weak. Right. You know, you, you, you're such a weak man. Why, why are you crying? You know, so it's like we need to have, be connected and show this emotional support. Yet we're not supposed mm -hmm. to be emotional. You know, if, if that yes. makes sense. And that, that's a that's a tightrope, as you talked about, to try to walk. It's double mindedness. That's double, you really, that's double mindedness. That's double mindedness. Yeah. So you can't have it both ways. You know, you're going to have to have some type of balance and, um, and give and take. It's a relationship. You know, it, it, it is a relation. It's a courtship. It's a relationship. There's a give. There's a take. There's a pull. There's another pull. There's a counter pull. Um, and if someone is just tugging, you know, this way, this way, I mean, what are you going to get out of that? That's no different than a man doing it to a woman. And that's what's the difference? What's the difference? Correct. Difference dogmatic and not being supportive. 
and saying horrible or her things not there. What's the difference? So I think we can kind of be, we always say double standards. We're there. We'll be putting on that same double standard. Um, and then we're going to raise boys in today's time to not be that way. And I, and I think in today, I'm seeing a lot more young men who have been now raised by, by women um, or have some association you know, that they are having balance. And the, and the pool of young ladies seems to be just everything's about me, 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 my, 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 and a whole lot of selfishness um, and a whole lot of materialism. And and then as we are maturing uh, older women, I'm it just my just me alone. If I'm looking, typically we go by age, age, in terms of wisdom or looking for a mentor or someone to guide us. Typically we go by age or the outside sources. Um, but if I'm looking for that, I'm finding a lot of who are older than me, who are not mature. And I'm not, and because age does not make you mature. I know this was a thing because all of the women that I knew growing up were mature. They, 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 they would just tell you, well, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I would think about it this way. And when I'm watching other older women, older than me, and I will ask them a simple question, well, what did you do? Or what do you think about this? They can't really give me an answer because they're still being ignorant, dropping it like it's hot. As if that's the thing. And I'm trying to get a perspective of what I need to be as, as the next level, as the next phase. Because as we say, who I am at zero, I'm not at 10. Who I'm at 10, I'm not at 20. And so on. Who I'm at 30, not at 40. And so each decade or each season, there's a change. And, and I think same thing with men. Each season, each decade, there's a change. You hope. You hope. Um, and so I think as maturity goes on and wisdom kicks in. And again, I'm boo, this, this, it comes with trials and tribulations. Wisdom comes with trials and tribulations. I'm going to say it again. Wisdom comes with trials and tribulations because it's the trial and the tribulation. And when you get on the other side of it, you can look back and say, I made it through and out. It, that is where the wisdom comes in. Wisdom does not come if you haven't been through anything. How can you tell me something if you ain't been through nothing? Who are you? How? So that's, and we tend to not want to go through those trials and tribulations. We don't want to put in the work when it comes to relationships, marriages, anything, it seems like sometimes. But it is those trials and tribulations on the other side of the sickness, losing a parent, losing finances, um, and that whatever that support system is that you, we hope to have. And we're all trying to look for that support system. That the, it has changed, but in many ways it hasn't. It, there's, as, some, as they say, as some things change, some things remain the same. A system is a system. Whatever that support system, it should be supporting you. And it should be helping. And you should be giving. You know, I, I tell people, if you're going to be a percenter, let me count on your 10%. If you're going to be a 50 percenter, I should be count on 50%. You know, and so, but 0%, let's just do the numbers. If you're not going to put in anything in, but you want everything out, well, that's not going to add up. That, I mean, this is not good mathematics. It's not even good common sense. So you're going to have to put in some type of work to support, to be there, whether it's for women, to, on women support, your significant other, or, or just becoming a mentor or whatever that journey is for you. I think in today's time, um, I'm hoping that women can lead the charge. I would love to see more women in those leadership roles uh, as of today. That, and that's what we're talking about. Um, and I, because we can be that, you know, we, we can be, we are leaders, you know, we are leaders. This is not like all of a sudden women became leaders. Like, like it just happened today in 2024. We've been leading a long time. You lead a family. Um, we, we've been leading for a very long time. This is not like all of a sudden, this is some hypothesis that just came out of thin air. We've been leading for a very long time and we will continue to lead. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So one thing I want to get back to when you were talking about, um, you know, putting in that work and, and what it takes to keep the relationship strong and, and, and move it forward. Mm -hmm. And I'll share a couple of stories from my side. And the stories, one story is what a man said about a situation. And another mm -hmm. story is about what a woman said about a situation. Two, to two okay. totally separate stories. I'll start with the one where I was talking to a friend uh, and he just started to date this woman. And she was, you know, had her own career, had her own house, had, you know, she was very well established. Um, and he got into like, you know, date two, date three. And he, I talked to him and said, well, what's going on with that relationship? 
He says, well, I'm not going to see her anymore because that but day two, day three, you know, understood her entire world. And his response was, what am I going to do for her? Mm-hmm. And because in his mind, all of her financial and, and things, stuff were already there. And so he felt like he didn't bring any value to the relationship because she already mm-hmm. had those things. And I thought that was a fascinating psychology because that's actually not what the relationship should be about. It should be about the emotional side and the, the inter- intimacy connections and all of that piece of it. But in his mind, his value and his worth were strictly tied to him being able to be, quote unquote, the breadwinner and provide. You know, so mm-hmm. he didn't pursue that relationship because he didn't see that as something he could bring to the table. So interesting psychology with that. Mm-hmm. The other story, that, which is interesting, is they're talking to this woman. She's a, a lawyer, uh, very successful. She's you know, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever it might be. So she's earning great money. Um, and they were asking her, you know, you know, why are you not married? And, you know, she said, oh, dating's hard. I can't find someone, blah, blah, blah. And, he says, well, what if, you know, this guy is a perfect match for you, you guys really fit, but he's uh, an auto mechanic. And she's like, well, I can't date an auto mechanic, I'm a lawyer, right? It's like, well, wait, is, is, it, is it just the optics that really matter or you, t- you want to look at the person? So then the, the guy followed up with an additional question. Okay, well, let's say he uh, started his life as an auto mechanic because he loves doing that, but now he owns the shop. So yeah, every now and then he'll go in and he'll turn a ranch because he likes doing that kind of work, but he's the owner. Would you? And she's like, no. And so that was like, well, why? And then he says, okay, well, maybe now he owns five shops and he's, you know, elevated to that level. Would you date him? She goes, no. And the guy was like, I don't understand. Well, what is it that you're looking for? He's probably making, you know, seven figures at this point, owning the multiple shops and yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. And she said, yeah, but, you know, mechanic, I mean, what is he going to talk about at a company Christmas party? You know, you're just like, oh, my God, you know. So her thought process of what this man needed to look like, and it was all about optics, you know. So it is fascinating to me how, you know, we got gotten to this point of having this divide. And mm-hmm. my concern with it long term is, especially in the, the Black or people of color communities, is economic impact that it's going to have if we keep our families disjointed like this and we can't get together and and start to create and build and it's not just about creating and then buying a house it's businesses it's other things that we can do when we're more united than when we're separated so long term how does that start to impact our communities and i think we're already starting to see that with some of our younger generation Mm -hmm. uh two on two sides one is not moving from home until they're 35, right? So not even getting out into the world to do, or definitely not even thinking about, thinking about getting married. I mean, I I talked to some people in their late twenties now getting married, I don't know, yeah, maybe in another 15 years, but that's so much Mm -hmm. time that's lost where as a unit, you could have so much more impact, I think, right? Maybe old school thinking, but I think there is, an economic value to that. I think there's a social economic value to that, that we really need to get our head around and start to figure out how do we reconnect between men and mm-hmm. women and our values, as we talked about, uh, and getting past the judgment and getting past keeping up with the Joneses and, and try to move ourselves forward uh, is really what we need to be focused to. Uh, but. It's just, just interesting the the psychologies and the mindsets that are out there right now, and that kind of keep us in this pointing fingers at each other versus trying to come together and, and work things out. We we talked about women and we talked about women as leaders, which they are. Uh, so two things that I want to bring to the table now. One is your perspective and just your feeling, and we all get one vote, as I say. So I get to have an opinion. <laughs> um, women in the military. Okay. Know, and 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 Ooh. how that plays out long term, and then uh, is this country ready for a woman in the White House as the president? You know, is is that are we there? And if we are, how do you see that playing out? Uh, so we'll start with the first one with women in the military. I'm all for it. Um, it personally, in our family, we have someone right now that's a female that's um, Air Force, just 
Scott Lieutenant. And we're very proud of her. Um, she's all that and then some, because she's a Skinner woman. <laughs> so we're very proud of her. And, and again, I'm going to go back to, but that's what she wanted to do. And she got the opportunity to do it. And she sees the moment. That's what she wanted to do. Um, I'm quite sure she's gone through whatever that is that you go through in the military and whatever that challenge was to even make that choice. Um, that's, that's, she will have to tell that story, but that's what she wanted to do. And, and that's my whole point about anything. No one, if that's what I want to do, historically women have been, if we want to do it, we can't do it. Or there's a law that tells us we can't do it. Or there's something that we are looking at right now that we can't do it. We shouldn't do it. She, she's not supposed to do it, blah, blah, yada, yada. No, if I woke up and wanted to do that, who are you to tell me what I can and cannot do? If I chose to do that, that's the gift to me of just being a citizen to make choices specifically in this country. That's our freedoms to pick and choose what we want to do. Um, so I am all for it. If that's what you want to do, technically, I don't want to be in the military. But will I judge another woman for wanting to pursue that career or that avenue or, or that challenge? I'll even say that. Power to her. Go for it. I'm going to say it a thousand times. Go do what you want to do because there have been so many women who could not do it for many reasons. So we could go into a whole Otello about. So if you get the opportunity to pursue that dream or that wish or that hope and, and that door opens, and if that door don't open, I'm a believer, kick it down. You know, just knock it down, take the hinges off and get it out the way. So that's me. Are we ready? for a female president. We have always been ready for a female president. The question is, who is the right female? Now that's the question on the table. Um, I, am, um, I am a pro believer in a woman can lead. We've been leading forever. <laughs> if I'm capable enough of birthing you, I think I'm capable enough of leading you. So, yes, I think we are ready. We've been ready. <laughs> and we shouldn't even be asking that question. The only question I ask, who is the proper person? I don't care if you male, female, blue, pink, green, or orange. Are you capable of leading a society? All of it. Not one part. And so, yes. If it's short and sweet, because I don't want this to become a political debate because it's very heated. <laughs> but yes, a woman is ready to lead this country. Um, and, and it's just time. It's been time. I, I think that's a level of, we've had male leadership in terms of that position, in terms of that position, in terms of what it looks like um, forever. It would be nice to see a different perspective. And do we know, and, and this is, I'm not doing any endorsement here. Just please be very crystal clear about it. I'm not doing any endorsement here. Uh, I have always been a firm believer that a woman should be president. I could have been president a long time ago. But there's always a natural order of things. You know, there's always a timing of everything. So is this the proper time? Time will tell. But to answer that question, yes. Yes, yes, extra yes with gravy on top, a woman can lead a nation. Women have led nations. Women are leading nations right now. And women can lead this wonderful United States of America. So I have a kind of a follow-up question. It's not necessarily related to politics or specifically anything like that. But in your experience and from your point of view or perspective, which would you say this country still has the most work to overcome? Racism or sexism? I'm going to say sexism. Because my experiences in terms of racism, for me personally, yes, I've experienced it. Obviously, I'm Black in America. Um, but for the most part, the way I tend to move, I don't let it get in my key. And even if, even if I have, I've been brought up to know 
that has nothing to do with me. That, again, is on you and your insecurities about who you are. And because racism is a learned behavior, so is sexism. But racism is a learned behavior. It is, when I'm in teaching right now, and it's not like I didn't know this, it's just being refreshed about it, I haven't been of children in terms of teaching in a long time. But when two little kids are playing, they don't care. They don't care if little white Johnny hit little black Johnny or little Asian Johnny did whatever, or mixed, it doesn't matter. Children are children. And they don't, they have to hear that. And that has to be developed here and here, here, specifically here um, in that part. Um, and if you're hearing that and experiencing that or been taught that and told that, that you adopt it. You adopt, like children are sponges. You know, they don't come out, oh, I'm racist. You know, you, you are hearing this, it's being fed to you, it's being spoon fed to you. You know, we can get into where the laws and all that stuff come from, but for the most part, children are children every day. They bow it out, they cry it out, they get mad, they have little boyfriends, little girlfriends, <laughs> they get mad. But what I love about children, and this is just this one about this just this week, where I watched the children just this week because I knew this interview was coming up. What was fascinating in this, this school where I'm at is very diverse. It has every nuance in it. And this week I've worked in special needs, um, for those who we know what that is. And so, but what I loved about, we had just incorporated them being, in, as they call it, the general population, how they would interact with the general population. And as we were taking them to the classroom, what I love about the, the other children, and I don't want to separate that because they're all the same children to me. But the other kids were just so helpful, making sure that they are okay. Are you okay? They come out of line and hug on them and, and make sure they're okay. And they're looking to see if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing with them. And they just love on each other. Like, hey, are you gonna come on the playground today? Simple, very simple, very caring, very loving, very kind. Do the, and, they, and they get into little scuffles, just like anybody else. But it was just fascinating just to watch them just this week alone. On how they don't care. We, the, we had a big parade uh, the, the, for Hispanic heritage. And they were in the parade like everybody else. And all the kids were screaming. It, it all sounds the same. Kids screaming, this kids screaming. And so, so they didn't see the variance of the differences. See that. It's only if they've been taught that. Um, and so I'm praying that the next two or three generations, just personally, just get away from that. So I'm gonna say sexism right now, because this seems to be this battle between man and woman, like I've never seen before. When we're all in this together. <laughs> so racism for me, yeah, I've dealt with it. And yes, I deal with it and I've always dealt with it. But if you've been taught that no one is better than you, you, know, you put your pants on just like me. And when I go into that bathroom, you in the same position I'm in when we're doing the other one. So who are you? So I don't see you better than me or different than me. I, I just see that we're all humans trying to get to a better understanding of who we are individually, collectively, spiritually, emotionally, um, and, and that we move forward. I pray we move forward in that grace and in, in that perspective, uh, whether it's for our families, individually, as a nation, as a country, um, because we're in a little pickle here and we got to get it right at this turn. There's some we always say that, and I say that just haphazardly, but we really are at a crossroad at a turn on what we really want our nation to look like because we've been such great leaders of the world perspective. And I, I don't want to lose that for the next. My grandkids are here, and I would love to leave a legacy that I've done something to try to help and not hinder the process that they could look back and say they call them and say their mama got in the game and tried and so i would leave it at this that get in the game and try to help fix versus complain and be judging about it and put in some effort some monkey grease as the, my great grandmother would say oil it up <laughs> And at least get it to working again 
and get in the game. You know, pointing the finger, just pointing. It's them, it's that, it's they. But what if that finger needs to come this way? And what are you doing to help at such a time as this? That part, yes, 100%. That part. So I'm going to give you a chance now to truly get on your soapbox because what I want to hear now is um, next 10 years, what do you see? What would you like to see happen, change? What do you feel needs to, to be done to start to move women forward, everything be more cohesive? And obviously this nation where we live and you know, have to live, work and play to become stronger, better, more balanced, kinder to each other, uh, however else you want to look at that. What, what would you like to share about that? The number one thing I would like to see in the next decade is that we're not still telling young girls what they cannot do. Um, that we're not planting that seed that your only way out over, through, under, above is through the process of just a man. Not saying that I don't want you to be with a man. Not saying that I don't want you to be with whoever it is, but that we're we're, we're planting the seed of I can do anything, and I'm capable of it. the The other thing that I would love to see that as women leaders, um, women leadership and mentors, that we're not trying to lead like men. In my mind, we were supposed to be the change and not the same. Dogmatic, angry boisterous, narcissistic, uh, condemning. Those were some of the traits that men historically had, uh, egos, um, power hungry, power, power, power. I would love to see us try to take those steps that historically we've seen men tend to abuse and that we were going to be the change in that, that we gave a little bit more methodicalness to it and um, see it through the eyes. I like to see it through the eyes of if I'm your shoes, what would I want to be perceived or do? Um, and what would I need feedback from to have for me a better leader, a better person, a better, whatever that role is. I would love to see us take more steps in implementing those values and infrastructures and um, mentorships in process that those seeds are planted younger um, and they're developed better. We tend to kind of got it supposed historically from the churches, um, but you know, they're in their influx as well. So it would be, that's one, that's two. And the last thing that I would love to see back into how women leadership and what society could be as when I, especially when I hear men talk about I said this, this is personal. This is going to be a personal note. There was someone recently, I heard say something really negative uh, about a, another woman. It was male. And let me put that into perspective, what I mean by that. Because this, women tend to think men tend to say very dogmatic. That's, that's not my experience. I, I tend to hear men be more um, pro-woman, go get it girl, you know, I, I get more of the praise and the encouragement than I've gotten the disadvantage. They don't think I have it, but I have. So, but I, I tend to pull on the other side of it. So to hear a man who's typically, who's raised daughters or have daughters and they have a respect for women, to hear them say something negative about a, a woman that was kind of personal to me, it, it hurt me because in my mind, I don't, they don't say negative things about a woman because they, they know they wouldn't say anything negative to me. And they're kind of like one of my mentors because I've leaned on them a lot in this transition for great mentorship, leadership. Um, and so to hear them, and it wasn't just one man, it was many men who I have respect for. And for me to give men a respect, it, it takes a lot. It's, it's standard is really high. Uh, I'm very, very hard on men, so get that standard. You're pretty good with me. And so to hear them say something negative about someone that was very personally close to me, it made me do my own self-reflection and introspective, like, wow, you're saying that? And so because she had lost her way, 
I would never want that to become the whole gamut for what women are now being judged at or let that be the bar because that's a low bar. You know, that's, that's not who women really are that I was raised to not to be. And so I would like to see us be a little bit more empathetic. Those are our gifts, empathy, intuition, um, a spiritual connection, wisdom, um, that mother wit, as my mother said, she thought if you're a mother, her mother wit, she was saying, she would just mean that she's matured into that role of understanding what it means for, for hers. Um, and it would be great to just kind of see that the next decade of women to be developed, to be those types of leaders at whatever level that is. And when I say levels, I don't mean that to be that a mother is a low level. A mother is to me one of the pinnacle because it takes, I love what my aunt said recently, it takes courage to become a mother. It takes courage. And especially if you are a teenage mother, it takes courage for you to go through that process to bring that birth into life and to nurture it into a, a human being to be a, a working viable citizen, however that is. And so if you tend to want to do that and to bring life onto this earth, that to me is the most beautiful moment that you can have to have the power and the gift to be able to develop that. And so what does that mean? I would like to see that be a little bit more sensitive, but not without withstanding boundaries and discipline and honor and integrity, but I think we can be a little bit more empathetic and it would be nice to have that implemented. But I think sometimes men can be a little bit more regimented dogmatic, less emotional in understanding the bigger picture of what's happening. Because if you run a family structure, you know all things are not equal. And no one human is the same. Even if you try to make them the same, they're not. <laughs> um, and so I think we could be better at that in the next decade, of um, developing younger minds to be more exploratory, creative, uh, facing more fears and giving them opportunity if they fall and fail, that they're just not play. You know, our, our future is not trash. Monique, thanks for joining today. This has been a, an excellent, excellent conversation and exchange. I think there was a lot of value and a lot of perspective that I hope our audience gains as they listen to this. And as you said, we get one vote. So we, we have our opinions and we, we get to share that. And for some people, it may resonate. For others, it may be, well, those people are crazy. But that's okay, right? Because it's the whole that's point okay. is we need to have this communication. We need to have the discourse. Because uh, how else do you work through things and, and get to the point of yes. moving things forward? So at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do here is move up all forward in the best way possible. And the, the only way that's going to happen is open, honest communication and being willing to put in the work, as we talked about, to yes. move where we need to get to. So I greatly appreciate you for joining. Uh, it's been an excellent day. And uh, until we speak again, take care and take care of each other. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Have a great day.